I told Roxanne what I would want to talk about is the difference between children and adults, especially vis-a-vis -vis CRPS. But first, I'll give you a, a little um, history of CRPS if you didn't know what it is, because there will be a point that ties these slides together. So the first description wasn't called CRPS. It was termed causalgia. And it was um, defined by Dr. Mitchell after the Civil War. And he noticed a lot of soldiers who had nerve injuries, who had this horrible syndrome that he describes here, uh, tortures which a nerve wound could, could inflict, red hot file rasping on the skin. I think that's something that probably many of you have experienced or have watched your loved ones experience. So it's not a new syndrome. It's been known since the late 19th century. Um, uh, Rene Lariche, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, began to describe it as a sympathetic disorder. He noticed that it was very similar to disorders of the sympathetic nervous system. And a few years later, in 1946, the term reflex sympathetic dystrophy was coined by an English physician, James Evans, who actually described surgical cutting of the sympathetic nerves in the abdomen as a method for treating that. We don't do this anymore. We have other ways of uh, interrupting those nerves, lumbar sympathetic blocks and neurolytic blocks of those nerves. Um, but it was termed reflex sympathetic dystrophy for decades until Stanton Hicks, whom unfortunately isn't able to be here today, and that's really a shame because he's quite an amazing individual and legendary in the field. Um, under the auspices of the International Association for the Study of Pain, um, formed a committee to redefine the nomenclature and the criteria for defining what this condition is all about. And this was the birth of the term that we presently use today, complex regional pain syndrome. It's much better than reflex sympathetic dystrophy because we know right now the pathology is not in the sympathetic nervous system. All the sympathetic changes that occur are downstream secondary effects, and it's not primary. It's complex because it's a complicated syndrome. It has many features involving many aspects of human physiology. The autonomic nervous system, the blood vessels, inflammatory conditions, and most recently, of course, we understand that a lot of the pathology is actually, and maybe all of the pathology, is actually in the central nervous system. In 2003, the Mayo Clinic published a, one of the best epidemiologic studies. That's a study that looks at the frequency of a condition in the population. And they found that about 21 patients, just under 21 patients in 100,000 population suffer from complex regional pain syndrome. As you probably are aware, in, it's much more common in females than in males, about four times more common in this study in our pediatric population. That's the one that I'm mostly concerned about. It's about seven or eight times more common in girls than in boys. The average age, they said, was 46. And they said there was no underlying psychological abnormalities that are associated with CRPS. That is to say, CRPS doesn't occur with a higher frequency in individuals who have a psychiatric diagnosis, such as depression, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disease, or what have you. And surprisingly, he said, they said in this study that the majority of these resolve spontaneously, which has not been my experience, and I assume hasn't been yours as well. Now, what all of these slides have in common, going back to the late, well, the mid-19th century, 200 years fast forward to today, what they all have in common is that none of them discuss children. And yet we know very well that CRPS does occur in children. And yet children in this field of, area, the field of specialty of pain management have really been ignored for all of these years. When I was going to, uh, when I was starting to prepare for this talk, I sent emails to a couple of dozen former patients of mine, now um, well into their late teens and 20s and even 30s, and I asked them to provide me some comments that I might be able to use in this talk to describe what it's like to be a child with CRPS. And one of the most articulate emails that I got back is this one. And I would say that this one is 100% typical of the experience of children with CRPS. And you've already heard some of these comments today. I, before I came to Stanford, I saw over 10 professionals, medical professionals, and not one of them believed my pain was real. Um, 
many of them told their, her mother outside of her earshot that basically she was crazy. This, this was in her head. She was making it up. Um, this is a very, very common phenomenon. And when I look back on the cases that we've had at Stanford to, since 1994 when I joined the faculty there, um, it's going back about 20 some years, um, this was the profile of CRPS in terms of ages. As I said, we saw it far more commonly in girls than in boys, about eight times more commonly. And as you can see, it is virtually unheard of before the age of seven or eight. It's very rare. I think it's fair to say there's never been a case reported in the medical literature under the age of seven. I've seen one seven-year-old who's in our program today, and there were a couple of eight-year-olds, but then it begins to take off and then peaks at about the time of puberty, which is an interesting phenomenon, which tells me right away something about the origin of this condition. Why does it occur more commonly in girls, in females? Why does it never get seen before puberty? So there's some, something having to do with a switch being turned, some hormonal change or some other change that is triggered by hormones that makes somebody vulnerable to CRPS. So that's certainly um, an interesting phenomenon. So what I want to talk about today are some of the differences I see between children and adults with CRPS. Um, one has to do with drug management, and I'm going to save that for last. What drugs are useful and why we use them and how they're different. What's another obvious difference between children and adults? Coping skills and motivation. Children are not born with coping skills. Coping skills are something that you learn throughout childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. And most children, especially young children, are not endowed with great coping skills. And they're often not endowed with a great deal of motivation to do the hard work that's required to recover from CRPS. What is not, what's another difference between children and adults? Parents. We have to deal with parents, which is challenging, usually rewarding. But we usually have three people in our exam room. We have the child, the patient, and we have both their mother and their father or a couple of caregivers. And, and we have to integrate that into our management plan. Another difference, school versus work. Adults work, children go to school. And there's a big difference because if you look at the me best measure of success of any pain program, uh, an adult pain program, it's the percentage of people you get back to work. If it's, a, if it's a housekeeper, um, some, a stay-at-home mom, then it, is she going back to work in the home, going back to taking kids to school, doing housework, et cetera? Or if it's a stay-at-home dad, are they doing that? Or if they have employment, are they back at work? Now, the success of pediatric pain management is, are we getting our kids back to school? Because most of the kids that I see with CRPS have missed a minimum of six months of school, and the average, I would say, is between one and two years of school before they hit our clinic. So what is our success rate in getting kids back to school? And I'm going to talk a little bit about school management as well. Another difference is resiliency, resiliency and healing. That's on the positive side. Children, as you heard earlier, I think it was Dr. Prager who said this, or it may have been one of the other speakers, but children are remarkably resilient. And children have an amazing capacity to heal because their tissues are young, their cells are young. Um, you've probably all have had the experience of seeing a child who's had some kind of an injury or a hurt or scrape or cut, and they heal amazingly quickly. Whereas you would stay black and blue and then yellow and green for weeks and weeks and weeks. So having said that, I want to show you a little video that illustrates the um, appearance and demeanor of a typical child at the time of diagnosis of CRPS. And this video is compliments of David Sherry, who's a physician at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who's made his name in treating CRPS. So I hope you have sound here as well. I think you will. Let me see if I can change that um, audio here by changing the audio on my computer. Um, uh, preferences? Um, 
You mean the computer preferences? Yes. Here? Yeah. And audio? Sound. And a few of the speakers know. Output. Output. Uh, I thought it would come through the HDMI, but the, out the other little cable is here. Uh, I think I do. I don't know. Oh, that's not a good idea, but I think this is going to work great. Okay. And this put output volume all the way up, all the way up. And okay, let's go back to the presentation. There, there, and let's see how this works. She was just a normal, healthy thirteen-year-old girl, active in track. Did you sleep okay? Yeah, I'm really sure it pains me. She's unable to run. She's unable, which she wants to do very much. And just her daily routine has been turned upside down. And we spent some time trying to figure out if it was just a muscle strain and, and normal kind of overworking. But it became quickly apparent that there was something more than that. And we took her to the doctor. They ran a series of tests and x-rays. And we really couldn't come to anything conclusive. They found that it was colitis, and then it started to get better, and then she put more strain on it, and then it just reactivated the whole thing. She has to use the crutches all the time, because even if she has tried to hop on one leg in small areas, and just that movement is too painful for her. And she can't move her toes. I've had kids around here with one broken leg, I've had kids around here with two broken legs at the same time. The difference is, is that you don't know what's really happening. When my son broke both his legs at the same time, I knew the problem. We could adjust for it. When the other one broke one leg, we could adjust for it. This one, as each of these new symptoms come, mm -hmm. it's dis disheartening that this is happening. And just moving to those classrooms with her books and supplies is really hard. And um, Friends have been helpful, but Oftentimes, friends just, you know, they're concerned about getting there themselves, and she's left behind struggling and, and feeling very frustrated. Oh, yeah, honey. Here it goes. You're hurting pain. I hurt this. She's said to me, I don't know what to say to these people that ask me what's wrong. She thinks they don't believe her, and mostly because they don't know what she's talking about. It's very difficult for her to explain what's going on. I wonder if there's something I don't know. Maybe you can wrap it instead of having to pull a sock on it. You can wrap it up and then bandage. Maybe that wouldn't hurt. She actually, she was. A leper? And yeah, and she even said, boy, I, I, I know who my friends are now. When we go up to recess, um, my friends just leave. Because they work slow. Well, I, I, think, I think this, uh, this three-minute video embodies just about every feature of CRPS you'd ever see in a child, besides the fact that her foot is obviously blue and swollen, and she can't walk on it, and obviously that's not something which is in her head. What do you see? You see a diagnosis missed by many doctors. She's gone from doctor to doctor, has been told it's phlebitis, it's in your head. You can see the severity of the pain and the disability this causes, um, and you see the effect it has on her on going to school. She's treated like a leper. That's a powerful term. Her, children, her childhood friends have abandoned her. You can't expect them to stick around. They want to run out and play, and, 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 and poor Rachel can't do that. And you see the overwhelming sadness, the depression, that the loss of her life. Her life is off the rails. So how, how are we going to treat CRPS in children? Um, it's really very much like what you heard Dr. Prager say about treating it in adults. And you heard Dr. Sadiq say this morning, you use it or you lose it. 
and, and physical therapy remains in children the one curative feature that we have. Perhaps not curative, but it's the one thing that we can do to reverse CRPS and return to a state of remission. Everything else we do is useful only in as much as it facilitates doing physical therapy, remobilization, reactivation. That is the only thing that counts. And here's, here's an email from that previous patient. For me, physical therapy saved my life and my quality of life and everything in between. It's the reason I am able to live my life on my own terms. She's a college student now. It's very, very important. On the other hand, it's very, very painful. And it's one thing if you're an adult and you can motivate yourself because you believe your physicians, you believe your physical therapist, and you believe that going to physical therapy is going to get you better and make you strong and return you to a functional state. But if you're 10 years old, that's a hard pill to swallow. What are you going to do? Physical therapy is painful. And so we need to figure out methods in children to make it tolerable, palatable. Um, that's where medication comes in. We can dial down the pain somewhat, but not a lot, with the drugs that you all are familiar with, gabapentin, pregabalin, Cymbalta, maybe clonidine, etc. We, it's fair to say we will almost never use opioids because opioids basically don't work for CRPS, whether you're a child or an adult. And if they do work, you have to take them in such high doses that they impede everything else that we're trying to accomplish because they're too sedating and, and they're, they cause too much dysphoria. So here's something you, you've heard a, a little bit about, which is virtual reality. Virtual reality is a powerful tool that we've discovered in the last few years. I have a few of my patients here, but I don't think they benefited from this because it's something that we started relatively re recently. If any of you have ever tried virtual reality, it's tremendously immersive. You forget the reality of your own world. So here's a, a cute little girl named Tessa. She just finished our program a few weeks ago. And, and I think what you'll see here is very instructive. You're gonna see Tessa crutch into our virtual reality room, afraid to put her foot down, and then watch what happens. So we do whatever we can to make physical therapy fun for children. It's very, very important that we have pediatric physical therapists. Um, and the sad thing is that most patients who have CRPS, who are children and adolescents, don't live in areas where there's children's hospitals and have access to physical therapists who are child-centric. Going to an adult physical therapist, a bread and butter physical therapist, as you heard, if you're an adult with CRPS is bad enough, but if you're a child with CRPS, and that physical therapist has little affinity for children, they may not like children, the rest of the physical therapy studio is filled up with 80-year-old stroke recovery victims, um, and they don't understand, most importantly, what CRPS is, is a formula for failure. That's not going to work for children, and one of the problems we have nationwide is a shortage of therapists. And speaking of therapists, what we do in our program, uh, when we have kids come into our, our full-time program, it's, it's eight hours a day, four and a half days a week. Um, it involves four hours a day of PT and OT, an hour a day of individual psychotherapy.
Now, the kids aren't necessarily mentally ill to start with. In fact, almost none of them are mentally ill to start with. The psychotherapy is exceedingly important. Think of Rachel in the video that you just saw. She wasn't mentally ill before she got CRPS. She wasn't depressed. She was a normal child. But she's sad and depressed and unmotivated now. Not only that, but she's sleep deprived. CRPS deprives you of sleep. You can't sleep. You can't fall asleep. You can't put your leg or your arm under the cover. It wakes you up four or five times a night. The CIA figured out decades ago that the way to grind somebody down and reduce their willpower to, to resist anything is to sleep deprive them. And that's what our patients are like. They've had months and sometimes years of nighttime sleep deprivation, which by itself is a, is a wonderful way to induce severe pathologic depression and anxiety. So we have a psychotherapist who works with our child every single day for an hour a day. We have group therapy sessions. We have a psychiatrist who sees the children once a week and manages medication therapy if it's indicated and sleep medication if that's going to be useful. On the other hand, this is the attitude towards most people who have CRPS uh, or children with CRPS. They're just seeking attention. We hear this so many times from not their parents, their parents understand that that's not the case, but from other caretakers, nurses, physicians on the outside, school personnel, family relatives, etc. But it's not this at all. They're not seeking attention. They would love not to have a condition in which they have to seek attention. And this is not new. Dr. Mitchell, who described CRPS in 1864, remarked on the terrible effect that nerve pain has on the mind. Not only on the body, but the mind. And now, of course, we know from functional MRI studies that the brain is different in patients with chronic pain, and specifically CRPS. It is truly a disease of the central nervous system. Now, the um, conventional wisdom in adults is that adults, as I mentioned earlier with the Mayo Clinic study, don't have any underlying mental health diagnosis that leads them to get CRPS or is associated with CRPS, but we have found the opposite in children. Almost 80% of the children that we see with CRPS have a diagnosable mental health condition. Uh, according to the DSM-5, which is the Bible of mental health diagnoses. And many of them, if not most of them, actually have that condition, though it was undiagnosed, before they got CRPS. And the most prevalent of these conditions is anxiety disorders. It's really interesting, and I don't know why this is. Perhaps it's just a side effect of our society that anxiety disorders are more and more and more common in children and especially adolescents. On the other hand, um, we get a surprising history from our patients, and usually this doesn't emerge until we've known them for two or three months because they're very good at hiding it. Things like they've had panic attacks for two or three years before they got CRPS and started coming to our clinic. Or they have terrible anxiety that manifests in some other way. Or they have depression. Or they have obsessive compulsive disorder. We had one patient who was compelled to press her knees together on the way to the clinic in the car with her mother driving every time her mother passed a tree on the median strip on the road. And, and it was classic. And we, had, we, we went months of treating her before we became aware that, in fact, she had this obsessive compulsive disorder that, that required her to do that. And obsessive compulsive disease is a form of an anxiety disorder. If you don't press your knees together every time you pass a tree, then you're, you're just bottled up with anxiety because something bad is going to happen to you. So we have to address these. And we're, because we're aware of this, and my colleagues in pediatric pain management around the country and the world also have made the same observation, we're sensitive to that, and we're very liberal and aggressive in addressing these mental health issues that children have in a variety of ways. We use cognitive behavioral therapy, family counseling, relaxation therapy, biofeedback, hypnosis, uh, mental imagery, acupuncture. All, we, we, we throw the book at our patients and we'll try a little of everything until we find something that resonates and works for that patient. So addressing the mental health aspect of CRPS, not just in coaching them 
and motivating them to perform well in physical therapy and working with our physical therapist to help them to understand the needs of every child, but also to address any underlying problems that child will have. And it's really important to focus on family therapy because as I said, when they're in the clinic, there's a child and there's two other patients, so they call themselves parents. And the parenting skills are usually um, maladaptive sometimes because parents are not hardwired to take care of chronic pain. They're hardwired to take care of acute pain. If your child twists their ankle, sprains, breaks their ankle, has appendicitis, what do you do as a parent? You put them on the couch, you bring them their favorite blankets, you hand them the, the Sony Wii or the, the, you know, the, the games or the iPad, you keep the other teenagers away from them, they don't have to take out the garbage, they don't have to empty the dishwasher or walk the dog, and the, you run interference with them, you envelop them in a little bubble of love, and in two or three days, you know, after they've had their appendix out, everything is hunky-dory. They're off the couch, they're back at school. And so smothering that child with love is a very, very normal thing to do when they have acute, an acute problem that's going to go away in a few days. But if they have CRPS or some other chronic form of pain, it's not going away in a few days. It may not even go away in a few weeks or months. And so doing that is very counterproductive. And we have to work with parents through family therapy to help them understand uh, the right way to address a child with chronic pain. And it isn't usually asking them every hour on the hour, honey, what is your pain right now? What number is it? We, need to, we have to focus their attention away from that. And then we get to school. And this is the typical, I just found this cartoon yesterday. Um, this is the typical, well, not all schools are like this, honestly, but many of them are. Too many of them are. Sometimes we have very sympathetic counselors and very antagonistic teachers, for example. That's the most common thing. They don't understand why they have to do anything unusual for this kid. If you can't read the caption, the teacher's talking to the parents in the con parent-teacher conference saying, your daughter is a pain in the ass. <laughs> and that's how they view, I hope that was okay with Caitlin there. So she's, she's heard worse, right? Um, this, is, this is how it's viewed by a, a lot of school systems and parents the school systems don't go to the parents and tell them, you know what, there's this thing called an IEP, an Individualized Educational Plan, which is your legal right under the Constitution as dictated by the Americans with Disabilities Act. No, nobody tells the kids that and nobody tells the parents that because as soon as the schools do that, they have to put a lot of resources on the table and those resources cost money and personnel time and that's two things schools don't have, especially these days and especially in California. So it's our job to run interference for the kid in the school. And that means sending letters, going to the school if it's within driving distance for us, talking to the teachers, counselors, principals, um, and educating them about what CRPS is. I was really thrilled to see the um, booklet that Devin has participated in putting together. That is really cool. And, um, and that's, gonna be, that's gonna be a really important resource for future children with CRPS so they understand that they actually have a constitutional legal right to be educated using whatever resources the school system needs to put on the table for them. So now, what about the outcomes of children versus adults? Well, here's an outcome. Um, this is a good looking outcome. Um, and this is what we're used to seeing. And I have a few of my former patients and current patients in the audience today and so, they've probably heard from me when I've said, you know, in children, CRPS is a curable condition, a reversible condition. And sadly, what I've learned over time is that it's, it's really not. It's, it's, a, it's a reversible condition, and we try our best to keep it at bay and give patients the tools to, to once we're in remission, keep stay in remission, or if they have a relapse, to learn how to jump on it early and not let, it to get, not let it get bad again, but I think it more or less is a condition that follows most people throughout life. Like diabetes, it can be controlled, but it can't be cured at this time. We did a study in which we um, uh, had 21 um, uh, kids, uh, a half and half boys and girls, and we, we looked at how they was, how we treated them with interventions. That was in a prior decade when we were very aggressive doing uh, nerve blocks uh, on these kids. 
and with psychotherapy and physical therapy, and we looked at what their outcomes were. And what we found was that um, boys had 100% good or fair outcomes. Good means they had no pain whatsoever when we were done with them after three weeks of treatment. Fair was they had 100% function, but still reported some pain. Girls, only 50% of them had good or fair outcomes, and 50% of them had poor outcomes. The boys had a 22% rate of recurrence over the next few years. The girls had a 40% incidence of recurrence over the next few years. Another interesting difference in gender between girls and boys, and perhaps a clue to what's causing this condition in the first place. So more recently, I was interested in finding out what happens to these kids once they're adults. Um, I've been doing this at Stanford since 94, and before that in Seattle from 85 to 94, and treated a lot of children and adolescents with CRPS, but was clueless about what these people were like when they were in their 20s and their 30s. Some of them have stayed in contact with me, the ones who are happy and healthy. I know many of them have had children. Um, but I was interested in finding out more details, so we did a survey. We got the names of everybody that we could from the medical records, and obviously we missed a few, as I've talked to a couple kids here, who, uh, young adults here, who um, we missed in our survey. And we sent them a questionnaire to fill out um, and, uh, once they were over the age of 18. And, um, and what we found was that um, we were seeing um, recurrences and persistent symptoms. So this is the same girl's foot that you saw in an earlier slide, and this is what she looked like two years later when she was 17. And when I looked at those feet, I thought, oh my god, I don't, I don't think we can make this better. But actually, she got back to the way she looked in the left-hand photograph, wound up joining the Navy, uh, and then had a recurrence as an as a ensign in the Navy, and had a medical discharge from San Diego. Um, so recurrences do occur, and even without recurrences, it turns out, to my disappointment, that pain does persist. So this is the data that we've assembled, and it's being prepared for publication now. So um, we looked at, I th think this represents about 70 patients altogether, now adults who had CRPS as children. The, um, the only correlation that we were able to find between persistent adult symptoms and CRPS as a child was that the younger the child was at presentation, the less likely they were to be suffering from any symptoms as adults. Which doesn't surprise me because those are the easiest children to treat. The seven and the eight-year-old children, the nine-year-olds, get better quickly with minimal effort on our part. Um, and it's really rare to see them recur, like, the, like Tessa, who is in virtual reality. But what you can see is that um, the blue bars on the bottom represent no symptoms, uh, none, none of these symptoms of limb pain. And then as you can see, um, the green are mild, the yellow are moderate, and the red are severe. So over 90%, well, about, actually, shouldn't count the blue bars, about 60% of patients or more have um, some symptoms of CRPS, even when they're asymptomatic in terms of their limb looking normal and functioning normal. They still have some pain when they're going through their day-to-day -day life. Most of them are coping and are normal, but some are like this. And uh, sadly, in sending our survey out to adults, we discovered um, two surveys went out to individuals who were no longer alive, and both had committed suicide as 20-something-year-olds because of persistent, severe CRPS pain. Um, they were symptom-free when they left our program, had recurrence and uh, as adults, as young adults, and then um, suffered obviously terribly and um, wound up committing suicide. So it's not as pretty a picture. So I, I want to close with um, just a couple of slides to talk about drug treatment. Now the drug treatment that we do for CRPS basically mirrors what's done in adults. We start with what I call unconventional analgesics. These are drugs that were not developed as analgesics as painkillers, like morphine or Dilaudid or Tylenol or 
hmm. naproxen, but these were drugs developed for other diseases that actually have analgesic effects, painkilling effects, with nerve pain. They come in basically largely two classes, the anti-epileptic drugs, those would be drugs like Lyrica, the gabalin, Neurontin or Gabapentin, Levetiracetam or Keppra, um, and drugs like, that are antidepressants. Uh, largely speaking, the tricyclic antidepressants, which are no longer used to treat depression, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, fizipramine, um, and then some of the newer SNRI antidepressants, namely Cymbalta or duloxetine and Effexor, which is venlafaxine. All of these have pain-killing properties. Now, um, we also use other adjunctive medications, clonidine, for example, to help with sleep and analgesia at night or during the day as a patch, etc. But what all of these drugs have in common is that not one of them has been studied in children. We, they're all drugs that we use off-label, and the problem with that is because they have not been scientifically studied in children, we don't know, scientifically speaking, if they work, we don't know how well they work, we don't really know what their side effects are in terms of the population or their risks, we, are, we really are flying by the seat of our pants. We have a patient who weighs 60 kilos and we say, well, a 140 kilo adult would get X number of milligrams, so I'm going to give one third of that and we'll see how it works. And we see a lot of side effects and problems in children that have never been, that are not generally seen in adults. The first cases of depression and behavioral changes associated with, with Neurontin were reported in a child. Now it's well known that they occur in adults also. We had our friend from Australia in the back earlier saying that he was on a, a high enough dose of pregabalin that his entire world was black. And, and that's, that's not uncommon, but it was never described in adults and described for the first time in children. Why is it that these drugs are not studied in children? Um, it's, it comes down to money. The pharmaceutical industry does not have a financial incentive to study these drugs in children. They don't have a financial incentive because, first of all, the population that this, uh, the childhood population these drugs would serve is small. They're not going to make a lot more money by doing the studies which cost $10 million each. They're not going to recover that investment in revenue. Number two, they cynically do know that we're going to use the drugs anyway. So not only do they not need to do the study because they don't think they're going to get a return on investment, but they'll actually get it pretty much because they're going to sell plenty of the drug anyway, even without doing those studies. And the third reason is they can hide behind the package label that says not approved under the age of 18 if there's a serious complication and use that to protect themselves from liability. So the U.S. government, the FDA, has stepped in to try to incentivize the drug companies over the last 20 years to do the studies in children, and that's, that effort has been an abject failure. So we still do not have drug company funded studies on how well these drugs work and how safe they are in children, and that's, that's a terrible thing. On the one hand, you can't blame the companies because they're not in the public health business. They're in the money-making business. They have stockholders, um, and their responsibility is to make as much money as they can for their stockholders. The responsibility is not to protect the public welfare. Um, but in that sense, the Food and Drug Administration and the National Institutes of Health have failed us because they haven't stepped into the void. So the NIH budget every year is about $35 billion, the National Institutes of Health. The business of the NIH is to fund medical research, to improve the health of the economy, to develop new drugs, new surgeries, new techniques, for taking care of America's ailments. And they spend $35 billion a year doing it. There's also billions more spent by the drug companies and by the National Science Foundation. Of all of this money, $360 million is spent on pain research. That's 1% of the NIH budget is spent on pain research. Not just, I mean, that's pain research altogether, adults and children and even those studies are not all really pain, but they, are, they might be a cancer drug study, and one element in that cancer study has to do with pain of the cancer patient. So 1% of the national research budget for medical research is spent to address pain, although pain is the number one reason why patients go to the doctor's office. 
It's the number one reason. Severe chronic pain is suffered by 200 million Americans, sorry, 21 million Americans, that's 10% of the population, another uh, 10 million children. Uh, it's more common than diabetes, heart disease, and cancer put together, and yet only 1% of the budget for research goes to study pain. I always say that Ben Franklin was wrong when he said the only sure things in life are death and taxes. What he should have said was pain, death, and taxes. Because very few of us are going to be fortunate enough to go through our entire life on this planet and not suffer pain. So it's in everybody's interest. And just to show you where our society is at here, this is how much we spent last week on Halloween candy, $5 billion. And you can read the rest of the list going all the way up to $84 billion a year spent on tobacco products and $300 million spent on pain research. That's a sad commentary. And that really, in my estimation, is why all of you are in the audience today. That's why you have CRPS. That's why there's no cure for CRPS or fibromyalgia or yada, 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 because we just are not doing the research. We can put a man on the moon, soon we'll put a man on Mars, um, and yet we're still suffering from the same pain that our ancestors did after the Civil War. Finally, um, I just want to um, uh, tell you one other thing which is a pretty big difference between at least the kids that I see in adults, and that is a lot of the kids know how to rap. So I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to close with this great video. Um, this patient's name is Alana. She's still my patient, though she's uh, now 19 years old, still a young adult, and uh, she has CRPS. It's been a very long road for her. She's not at the end of the road yet, but she did this fabulous performance, and I hope you enjoy it. And with this, I'm going to thank you for your attention.
And even though you have felt pain, long and stain from happiness, you abstained. You raise your eyes to the sky and then kiss your face. You are alive, and you know now there's nothing you can't survive. Well, I, I, I wish I could stay and take questions, but in four minutes, there's a cab outside to take me to the airport. Um, what time is it? It's about 3, 3 10. I have five minutes, I guess. If, um, Rock, where's Roxanne? Do you want to do questions for five, or are we, do we need to move on? All right, any questions? Uh, gentleman in the back in the orange shirt. Nice shirt, by the way. All right, uh, the gentleman said if you didn't hear him that um, companies doing research in the field of CRPS are always looking for volunteers. We, we call those human subjects, and so please be willing to sign up for clinical trials if you're approached. Yes, ma'am? Yeah. In the, on the line. Um, I, I, there's no bright line between uh, childhood and adult, but certainly what I've seen is that CRPS is, is, is different in a 10-year-old than it is in an 18-year-old. Um, the 18-year-old resembles much more the 35-year-old who gets CRPS after a wrist fracture, um, uh, but there's elements of the 10-year-old also. So we have patients of that age who come to us with CRPS and we treat them aggressively, as I've described, and they, they tend to do well. I mean, we can, we can almost always put them in remission, um, and, um, to, and I, but I think the, the important thing is that we're really unwinding a multidisciplinary program for them. Josh Prager described the same thing. These elements are very, very expensive, and they're difficult to put together, and they don't exist in most places around the country. So there's, in, in pediatric land, there's, there's just a handful of places, maybe fewer than 10 nationwide, that do what we do the way we do it. And so it's, um, it's, it's really hard for individuals who live in more remote areas, rural areas, or small cities to find the practitioners who know how to take care of this problem, or we can even recognize it when they see it. Yes. Um, Dr. Prager mentioned a website um, that's, um, that's um, an, uh, run by the NIH. It's, it's um, clinicaltrials, one word, dot gov. So um, it's now mandatory that whenever a human experiment is being done for any reason at all, the trial has to be registered on that website. So you can go on that website and search for pain, complex regional pain syndrome, RSD, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, and you'll that search will give you any clinical trials going on uh, in that area, and whether they're still enrolling, and what the enrollment criteria are, are for that trial. So that's the best source for that information. The question was, how can you find out where clinical trials are going on? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we missed a November 1st deadline with um, one of the journals, but uh, actually we decided we didn't want to submit to that journal. So the, the paper is just about ready for submission. So it should go in, and, and if it's accepted, then usually publication is in two or three months. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Well, you know, now, yeah, being able to give accurate information is important. Now, so if you, if you look at that, that, that slide that I put up, there's, there's still about maybe 15, 20 percent of, of the children, when they're surveyed 10 years later, are, are symptom free. And that's really encouraging. Or the symptoms are very, very mild. Um, that are no different than other symptoms that other people live with, like some back pain every day, or once in a while if they go out on a hike and they're uncomfortable the next day or something like that. So that does describe, you know, optimistically, a significant percentage. But no longer do I feel comfortable telling parents, well, this rarely recurs in children. Uh, or in, for the rest of their life or something like that. On the other hand, you know, I don't want to paint a dark or bleak picture for parents because, you know, there's always hope. You already asked, let me, before I come back to you, let me see if anybody else has a question. Okay, gentleman in the gorgeous orange shirt. No, but I wish we had included that question. That would have been a great question to ask. Um, that would have been a really good one. We looked for other correlations, age at onset of CRPS, um, recurrence rates, race, um, uh, gender. None of those really correlated well with symptoms in adulthood. But the um, uh, gender came close to being statistically significant and probably is significant, but it was a small survey. And as typical with most surveys, you get about 35% of the people that you send them to sending them back. And we, you know, a lot of them went out to dead letter addresses um, or emails that no longer existed because we have no way of knowing 10 years later where somebody's living. We just kind of rolled the dice and hoped we would hit them. And so we got 35% back. And um, that was, I think that's typical. And you always wonder with a survey, are the people who are the most effective, s affected sending them back, the ones that are the unhappiest? Or maybe the ones that are the happiest are sending them back, and the ones who are really, really debilitated are say, oh, the hell with it. Um, you just don't know if you're getting a cross-section uh, that's representative. Yes, I think last question. Is, um, CRPS um, well, let me put it this way. Uh, we don't know what causes CRPS. But I think my per personal prediction is that 10 years from now, we're going to understand that it's a genetic disease. Why does one patient get CRPS and the other thousand kids who sprain their ankles playing soccer don't? I, I think it's more than just bad luck. I think that there's probably a genetic vulnerability that they have. And um, so then we have like the, the lady who just said, sitting here that she has CRPS and her daughter has CRPS. That is probably not an accident. And uh, we, so there's, there's probably something significant. Finally, individuals have, before DNA sequencing became available, but it's still very, very expensive, um, individuals looked at what was called HLA typing. So HLA typing looks at specific proteins that are found in the bloodstream, um, and, the, and you can subtype these proteins. So there's three or four or five HLA types that are associated with CRPS or different forms of CRPS. There's one HLA type which is more common in, in patients whose CRPS becomes generalized, crosses to the other side of the body, uh, involves other limbs. Um, and so there, so there are definitely hints and clues right now to suggest that there is a genetic component, if not a genetic cause of CRPS. So in that sense, it's hereditary, but not everybody who carries the gene winds up getting it. So uh, probably that's the case. All right, thank you for your attention. And um, congratulations to all of you for showing up. As they say, showing up is more than half the battle.